Hi, uh, good afternoon. I'm Fleur Lewis. I head up our food and drink sector at Bishop Fleming. Uh, for those of you that don't know us, we're a mid-tier accounting practice and we're based, large, based largely in the southwest of England. So hopefully by putting a food and drink webinar after lunch, you're well fed. Uh, there's nothing worse than talking food and drink on an empty stomach. Uh, we work with a huge variety of ambitious and exciting food and drink businesses across our region, which means I'm fortunate to spend time speaking with businesses in the sector but my knowledge and expertise is vastly inferior um, compared to our guest, Ian Wright, who is CEO of the Food and Drink Federation uh, and the voice for our sector. So welcome to our webinar, which we are co-hosting with Santander. And over the next 45 minutes, you'll have the opportunity to hear from Ian on the state of the food and drink nation and ask any burning questions you may have using the Q&A icon, the speech bubble at the top of your screen. Uh, just gonna hand over to Jenny to introduce yourself uh, and our guest, thank you. Thanks very much, Fleur, uh, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm really delighted to be here. Um, my name's Jenny Tasker, and I work for Santander UK. Uh, I have two roles within that bank. I am head of international clients, and I also run our West Midlands corporate and commercial team. Um, food and drink is a sector that is extremely close to our heart at Santander. Um, we ran our Global Food Forum earlier this year, which hopefully many of you have the opportunity to attend. So much has changed since then, um, and we are delighted to continue partnering um, with the Food and Drink Federation. So I'm going to keep this really brief before we get over to, to the main event. Um, but just in terms of Santander and the food and drink market, just wanted to put a spotlight on uh, how, how we're supporting clients um, throughout the whole ecosystem whether it's our global agriculture footprint and what we do to support kind of growers and suppliers in diverse landscapes, uh, whether we're helping you through our connectivity events, launch new market, launch new products in new markets, or whether it's in the more conventional managing your working capital as you import and export. Or finally, whether you're distributing to end users, uh, whether that's supermarkets or the hospitality industry. So whatever your business size or whatever role you play within the food and drink ecosystem, we, we're delighted to have a number of our clients, really proud of a number of our clients are joining us today. But if you're not currently talking to Santander and would like to, we'd be really delighted to start a conversation about how we can help you take that next step whether it's managing some of the risks and changes that we'll talk through uh, over the course of the next 45 minutes or so, or whether you've got an ambition and you just want to take that next step. We would really welcome the opportunity to talk to you and share some ideas. So what we'll do now is I'll shortly hand over to Ian Wright. Uh, Ian will be very well known to many of you in his capacity of CEO of the Food and Drink Federation. Ian's going to talk for around about 15 minutes on a state of the nation address, uh, and then we'll move to a Q&A. So as Fleur said, please do, don't be shy, put your comments um, in the Q&A box, and Fleur and I will be asking as many of those questions as we can get through um, with, a, with a three o'clock hard stop. Um, so you know, if there are any burning questions on your mind now, or that come to mind after listening to Ian's address, please do shout up through the Q&A box. And uh, without further ado, it um, gives me great pleasure to hand over to Ian. Uh, Ian, we're really keen to hear your thoughts. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here with my friends from Santander and Bishop Fleming. Um, and over the course of the next 15 minutes, so up to about 20 past two, what I want to try and do is cover a uh, some of the key things that are happening in our industry at the moment and what I think we should uh, be thinking about uh, to some degree about what we should be doing right now and then a bit later towards the end of the time up to 20 past two but also a lot in q and I'm going to try and focus a bit on what we can do and what we could expect to happen in the future. Um, now you might ask not unreasonably why are there no slides um, and the simple answer to that is because I'm exceptionally lazy and I've just come back from four days walking in Westmoreland. I know those two things are co probably um, not terribly compatible and I can tell you that I had not realised quite how difficult it is walking downhill in uh, large parts of uh, rural England. It is perhaps the most challenging thing I've done in a very long time. Um, 
and given that I was walking with a with a seventy year old and a seventy five year old uh, ex bishop, retired bishop, I feel a bit shocked at how incompetent I was to do all of this. But one of the interesting uh, sidelights of that v visit to what is a wonderful, wonderful part of the country, um, on the edge of Yorkshire and uh, Lancashire and Cumberland, and in fact in the, the old county of Westmoreland, one of the most extraordinary things was that even there, even as we visited um, that fantastic part of England, the some of the concerns and problems that now face the industry were absolutely manifest in Kirby Lonsdale High Street. Um, and it, to, the, to the extent that um, my ex-bishop ex friend, who's quite tuned into all of this stuff, having been a, a sort of um, kind of temporary member of the House of Lords for the time he was Bishop of Leicester, um, is, he's quite a sort of, well, he's, he's obsessed actually with politics. Um, it's quite funny, really. Uh, but he, even he noticed some of the things that were manifestations of some of the concerns and problems we face. And let me just tell you what those were. First is, uh, Kirby Lonsdale, for those of you who don't know it, is a beautiful town uh, in the middle of the South Lake, on the sort of intersection of the South Lakes and um, some of the best walking country in Britain. And it has a high street that is made up of a, number, a huge number of independent shops, grocers, bakers, uh, other retail outlets, the kind of one amazing shop for walkers, which is kind of like an Aladdin's cave. And then several pubs, a rather a large number of pubs and restaurants and bars and cafes. And it was absolutely, um, it was so obvious that all of those outlets and indeed the supermarket that could be Lonsdale, a bit unusual in that it doesn't have a Tesco or an Asda or a Morrison's or a um, Sainsbury, <clears throat> but it has a Booth's. And for those of you who are familiar with Booth's, you will know that it is perhaps the most upscale supermarket in the country. It's used to be known as the Northern Waitrose, but in fact, I think it gives Waitrose quite a significant run for its money. Uh, a lot of independent products, a lot of locally sourced products. Um, and in both booths and in the local spa and in all of those shops and restaurants that serve or bars and pubs that serve food and drink, a series of really interesting concerns. First of all, just about every shop had adverts for, for pleading almost for staff. Um, and those, there wasn't one uh, member of staff, it was several in each case. So in a small baker's shop, which I would guess normally has, uh, would probably normally has six staff working there, they're only got three. <clears throat> and the consequence of that is that there's all sorts of things they can't do. There's product limitation, there's limitations on the product range, there's limitations on the number of people they can have in shop. That is not a consequence of COVID anymore. It is simply a consequence of the number of people they can serve. And there's limitations on the hours they can run. Perhaps most important for that business, they can't open their tea room. Um, and there is demand, absolutely clearly. It's not that they haven't got any demand in Kirby Lonsdale High Street. They've got lots of demand. They just don't have enough staff to do that. And that was repeated in a series of the grocers and the small cafes and tea shops and coffee shops up and down that, that street. Secondly, if you looked at the menus that they were offering and the uh, licensed restaurants were offering, you could see that there was real restriction on the available products. So uh, anyone who has been out to eat in the last few months will have noticed that the number of products that are for sale are that are on offer has been has been constrained, and the number of, of different variations has been constrained. The number of side side dishes has been constrained. And whereas previously you might have had a menu replete with options, now pretty frequently you're down to five. Intriguingly, in many restaurants that excludes chicken, because chicken is in very tight supply as a consequence, both of HGV drivers 
uh, shortages and because of the number of people available in abattoirs to kill them. And more recently, but not necessarily quite at the moment, uh, because of the CO2 shortage. So menu constraint is, is a significant part. So too is out of stock of wine and other drinks. So in, in several of the pubs, and certainly in one I was in last night to eat in, the wine list was massively depleted because the, the and this is fairly mainstream stuff, we're not talking about high end, we're talking about their main selling Shiraz, um, Malbec, Cabernet Sauvignon Reds, and their main ser selling Sauvignon Blanc, Chardonnay Whites. All of those were in short supply or the named brand that they normally sell just wasn't there and they'd had to substitute another one. <clears throat> and the, uh, the guy who was running the restaurant told me that, that they've been in that state for about four or five weeks. Another manifestation of this was that uh, a restaurant bar serving 80 people had three front of house staff. Now that's nothing like enough. Uh, and the consequence was a very long gap between, for them and it wasn't their fault and it was a very nice atmosphere so nobody was complaining, but a very long gap between the service uh, between the menu, uh, the order being taken and each course being served. And that apparently is also standard practice across all the bars and restaurants in uh, in Kirby Lonsdale and in that part of the country. Similarly, the same was evident when we went hilariously to Morecambe uh, yesterday, never been to Morecambe before, fine place, um, and a completely different end of the, uh, of the scale, as you can imagine. But even in, Mor in Morecambe, exactly the same effect happening. Not enough staff, very significant pending constraint. And when you add to that the news that uh, uh, and this is perhaps the, the cause of that particular problem. In hospitality over the last 10 or 12 weeks, we're told that one in five orders haven't shown up across the board. That's 20% of orders are not fulfilled. That is a massive problem and the driver of those are non-availability of driving, of, uh, of transportation, HGV drivers, but also the inability of individual manufacturers to fulfil those orders uh, because they don't have the staff. The same is true in our supermarkets. It was manifest in booths. There were, although there were very few gaps, it was evident that in some places on, and I'm quite a skilled viewer of these things now, um, indeed, if you see me in a supermarket, you may, you may think I'm preparing to shoplift because I walk up and down the aisles trying to work out what should be there and what is there because they're covering uh, the shelf rather than no their normal offer. And supermarkets become very skilled at this. They extend, though where they've got product, they extend the range to make sure the shelf isn't empty. <clears throat> indeed, in some supermarkets, we know in some metropolitan locations, they don't extend the shelf, they take it out. So they are literally removing aisles in order to uh, to avoid the spectre of empty shelves and therefore the social media concern. All of this adds up to the fact, and I've talked about this before, so I won't bore those of you who've heard me before, that just in time is over. Uh, the just in time system that we has underpinned our uh, way of uh, delivering food from manufacturers and farmers through retail or through out of uh, out what we call out of home, either through restaurants, bars, hospitality, or through uh, takeaways and sandwich shops, or through contract catering, the just-in-time system is now no longer operative. That doesn't mean we will run out of food. Big red letters, double underlined. But it does mean that choice is being constrained, and the. In fact, the biggest single dis, uh, kind of distinctive factor about British food for the last 40 years, and certainly British supermarket choice, and certainly British uh, restaurant and hospitality choice, has been that you've had the widest possible variety of food at all price points and in all geographies. And that, to me, is now uh, a thing of the past. It may come back, but I'll come to the reasons that it's gone in a second. It is a danger that ju and just in time evolved partly because we had the resources to deliver it through logistics and through manufacturing and through uh, brilliant organisation by the retailers. And partly we were able to deliver it because uh, as, a, as a result of supermarkets, particularly 
wanting to extend their shopping space, so they no longer had storerooms. So what happens? What has happened is that supermarkets over the last 40 years have pretty much got rid of their storerooms. They may have a small space where they store product, but instead of that, the product goes straight into the place on the shelf, is available for sale. The capital that they've invested in all of this is working from the get-go rather than being held in some place where shoppers cannot access it. And that has made a more inefficient, a much more efficient use of capital. It's made a much more efficient uh, system for the retailers. But it depends on the labor being available to, to make the product, to deliver the product, and then to put the product on the shelves. And all of that is under concern, under real uh, stress, as a consequence of the labor shortages that we face in this country. Now, those labor shortages are not restricted to food and drink at any point, either in retail or in hospitality. They are everywhere in the UK market, but food and drink is the one that's become the sort of poster child for this particular uh, problem. And we reckon, having done some work on this with Grant Thornton, the leading accountants, uh, who did a report for us and the NFU and a number of other food uh, trade associations uh, about six or eight weeks ago, we believe that of the four million people who work in food and drink from farm to fork, <clears throat> and that food chain, let me remind you, goes farmers and growers to manufacturers through to and, and via importers and may go direct from the farmers to retailers, hospitality, contract caterers and food to go. And underpinning all of that are our friends in the packaging industry. 70 percent of UK packaging is for food and our friends in uh, logistics, that's drivers, distribution companies, and in some cases, journeys by train. 45% of business journeys, commercial journeys in the UK by road or rail are for food. So they're both, both plastics, both packaging and uh, logistics are part of our industry. Four million people from farm to fork, half a million job vacancies across the sector. More than half, the 1.1 million, the million vacancies mentioned today uh, in the statistics published today, the vacancy statistics published today, more than half of those are in the food and drink industry. Now, that is a phenomenal gap. It is the case that we've probably run short of, of some 100,000 or maybe 150,000 workers permanently, and we've managed to escape that. But now the pressure is on. Where have those workers gone? They've gone in four different areas. About We know 1.4 million European workers who had registered for settled status or leave to remain have gone home. We know the two that is probably much larger than that because the ones who hadn't registered for settled status as they didn't need to before the 20th of March last year may be unca are uncountable, but it could be another million people. We know that 400,000 people have transferred into online retailing not just food and drink, but online retailing in all its settings since the lockdown. That includes a very large number of HGV drivers who have opted to do distribution for Amazon or Tesco or even Uber Eats and a whole range of other uh, online retailers because they're nicer jobs, they're in better conditions and they're better paid. We know half a million people, mostly over 50, but not exclusively, have opted to become economically inactive. That's either a result of their choice of a different lifestyle post lockdown. They've decided they don't need the money, they can afford to give up work or at the start of their careers, they've opted to go into full time education again and extend their qualifications. And then the other change, which has not been as well publicized, is that since the 2016 vote to leave the EU, the character of our overseas students has changed. So our overseas students who were predominantly European and who work, <coughs> excuse me, who work their way through college, uh, through through their studies, college, university, wherever they were, by often working in either the food and drink sector or some of them in the care sector, they've been replaced over the last uh, five years so that the character of our overseas students now, now is different. And many of them are from Asia, very many from China, and those guys don't work their way through college, either because they choose not to, or because their sponsoring governments don't let them and insist that they concentrate on their studies. Now, those changes 
are not all going to impact. All of those people are not in food and drink by any means, but they massively impact the availability of labour to us. And the consequences are the ones I mentioned at the start of this talk. And it's clear that the government is not prepared to respond to that. Government believes that it's been elected on a mandate with an immigration policy that is, is pretty inflexible. They believe that British workers can be trained and skilled to do those jobs, and they're not going to move on these issues, except in areas of great concern, as with lorry drivers, uh, over the period up to Christmas. It's our contention, and we've got to prove this to them, that the workers are just not there, that they've just got the numbers wrong, they don't understand the numbers. And even those who are there choose, for whatever reason, not to do the jobs that are available in food and drink. And the combination of these two is causing a massive concern and has a really big impact on what's available in that high street and in those pubs, uh, as I was describing. Two more things and then I'll shut up and answer questions. Uh, one is that you will have seen that the government, that another issue that we face, and this is, I think, an even longer term concern for our industry. For the first time in 40 years, alongside that issue on uh, labour shortages, which leads to the end of just in time, we've also got food price inflation back in the equation. Uh, now, I'm old enough to have been at university in 19, from, uh, I know it's difficult to believe looking at me, but I was at university from 1977 to 81. And I was actually in a Sainsbury in my university town uh, on the day that inflation hit 27%. And I remember with great uh, concern, actually, that in those days they used to put little stickers on items to show the price. And they had to go around twice, and in some cases three times, changing the price, because it had gone up twice or three times during the day. That is not where we're going yet, but it is the direction of travel. <clears throat> Food price inflation in the... Uh, in uh, out of home and hospitality is currently somewhere between 14 and 18 percent. So costs are going up and you will have seen that. And if it isn't the cost that goes up, then the size of the portion goes down. That's just as much a cause of in, that's just as much an indication of inflation. Um, so the first thing is that you've got food price inflation there already. And that's driven partly by increased wages. It's driven partly by commodity costs, so just about every commodity has gone up, partly by fuel costs and very, very specifically by things like the gas price. So the gas price, gas is really important because just about every food factory in the country runs on gas. So we have food price inflation alongside shortages and, you know, that is the beginning of a not very pleasant situation. My final word is a bit of a different point but I will just make it now and I'll come back to it if anybody's interested. I do think for the long term, we have to worry for, as a food manufacturing industry, and that's the bit I represent, um, about the future of our supermarkets. Alongside this just-in-time change, we're also seeing a change in the ownership of our supermarkets. So previously, they were all four owned by listed companies, Asda, Sainsbury, Tesco and um, Morrison's, were all owned by companies listed on the London Stock Exchange or in America, Walmart, uh, the owner of Asda. So there was some level of transparency about the way the supermarket operated. Uh, you could, at the ultimate, become a shareholder of that supermarket if you didn't like what you were seeing or what you were getting or the way they were treating you. You could either use the grocery code adjudicator or you could go and become a shareholder and go and question the, uh, the retailer directs through its annual general meeting or some other mechanism. With two of them now owned by private equity, and I will bet you that private equity will bid for a third and possibly a fourth in the next three months, that opportunity is hugely restricted. That's the first concern. The transparency is restricted and it puts an awful lot of uh, pressure on the grocery code adjudicator in the GSCOP system to kind of balance that up. And it's actually not really within the scope of the grocery code adjudicator to do so. The other big concern is that private equity, as we all know, has a particular approach to the way it does business. Nothing wrong with that. It's very clear. You know what you're getting. But private equity has a habit of loading the businesses it acquires up with debt, 
using that to facilitate larger dividends for the partners in and the private equity investors and expecting those who are running the businesses to take cost out on an epic scale, <clears throat> make them much more efficient as they fit the business for flotation and an exit or a set trade sale three, four, five years later. That model would be extremely difficult for many suppliers of the kind I represent to deal with going forward. And it's a big concern for the future of the industry. And having cheered you up massively with all of that uh, uh, analysis of our current industry, I'm going to hand you back now uh, for questions. Fleur, Jenna, over to you. Thanks, Ian. Gosh, that's, there's a lot to unpick there uh, and uh, we're getting a lot of questions in um, as well. A question from me. Um, you were just talking about um, just in time and how that um, is changing, but obviously we've also been talking about online um, and how I guess consumers are expecting deliveries direct to their door. So almost you've almost got a mismatch between uh, what the producers and manufacturers can do and what the consumers are expecting. Where do you see that going in the future? Well, I think online is here to stay and I think it will continue to grow. Um, we saw a massive growth of it during the lockdowns. Um, it played to people's concerns in the lockdown. Um, it was a very, um, you know, delivery to your door is, is something that is widely loved now in our country. I think it I can't remember what the numbers were, but it went from something like 7% to nearly 16 or 18 um, in two weeks. As it And the only constraint on its further growth was the capacity of each of the supermarkets or the retailers or whoever to, de to deliver. Um, and I think we're now all familiar with the, with the, um, with the you know, massive in increase in the number of distribution companies who specialize in online delivery. Um, and it's here to stay now whether that will extend i mean it's it's and it's not just the supermarkets you know we've seen uber eats extend we've seen other delivery services do very well um and now we see uber eats and deliveroo moving into delivering short order supermarket orders within <clears throat> you know often within 12 hours sometimes within an hour there are some here some services here where i am in london now where you order and they guarantee delivery of 10 items within an hour. I, I think we will see we will see some of those endure. We'll see other players come into the market. We'll see some disappear. I think we will also see, I mean, there was a big, something happened really, I really think this is important, although it's kind of quirky last week. For the first time ever, the post office, the Royal Mail, delivered mail to uh, remote Scottish islands by drone. Now, Amazon have trialed drone deliveries of flowers in the US and those proved popular and successful. So I think we could assume that provided the air traffic control concerns are overcome, we could see drone deliveries, certainly of takeaways and possibly of short order 10 12 items. I think it's a bit more di bit difficult to see it, it being very many more, but who knows. But those kind of completely unexpected technologies and certainly eventually, although I think there is a bit of public resistance to this, a customer, a consumer shopper resistance, but I think we will see driverless vehicles delivering stuff and, and robots delivering stuff within the next three or four years. Indeed, I'm sure it's being trialed somewhere. Um, Amazon has launched last week its grocery direct service across the country. Um, all of these are indications that online is here to stay. Some manufacturers are going to trial their own direct deliveries um, and the ones with particularly, you know, particularly high quality or top end products will be able to get the margin. So I think it will, I think it will blossom and um, grow. I think we'll see some things that we're currently seeing not work and be pulled. But it, and it's all a question of whether you can make a return on it. But online is definitely going to form a bigger and bigger part. I, I actually think it won't. I think there are parts of shopping 
uh, in person which are both social and kind of satisfying and assuming that we don't go to another lockdown I think we'll see that do well but I wouldn't but what I mean so for example one of the one of the big questions about ASDA and I'm not saying this with any sense of you know I don't I, I wish ASDA very well um, but one of the big questions about ASDA is it, it happens to have very large stores some of them in locations which are you know, not the most favoured. <clears throat> and the question is, do all of the retailers who have very big stores, those old, those super stores, really super, super stores, are those really continuing to be operable, valuable? Are they something shop? I mean, I remember going to the one in Peterborough, the big Tesco in Peterborough, and being absolutely flummoxed by the fact that the guys doing the shelves, the, the merchandisers were on roller skates, it was such a big store. Um, and, you know, that I think indicated that it was too big. It seemed to me that there was kind of less than there. If you couldn't walk around it, it was probably too big. Um, but we will see what happens to those. So I think we'll see fewer and fewer mega stores. Uh, some of them might be turned into distribution centres or fulfilment centres. And we'll see more, um, more stores that are centrally located because people will want to continue to, uh, to visit them so long as they're not locked down. But I think we will see online continue to grow very, very markedly. Brilliant. Um, thanks very much, Ian. Um, thanks very much, Ian. Um, look, I mean, I think that topic of innovation is, is really, really topical and perhaps it's something that gives us kind of pause for thought and a bit of hope amongst the, the kind of bleak landscape. I mean, certainly during COVID, uh, we were really proud of being able to support a number of small independent businesses turn from retail offerings actually to e-commerce and actually be able to satisfy that demand for home deliveries, etc. So, so yeah, and we certainly see crisis as an accelerator for change, don't we, in this industry. But kind of coming back to some of the questions that have come in, and, and thank you so much for all your questions. Please keep them coming. I guess the question has two parts. So we've talked about some of the crises, some of the challenges. OK, so we've talked about shortages, be that of labour or product, cost price inflation. We've talked about changing consumer demands and private equity ownership. So of all of that challenging landscape, which of the challenges do you see as temp more temporary and which ones do you see as more structural for the industry? So once you've tackled that part, the second part of the question is around, in your view, are there any real efforts being made by the government to support the food and drink industry? Well, the second part of the government is is trying, yes. <clears throat> I'm not one of those who um, ascribes all of these challenges to Brexit. Um, now, let me be clear. I was a massive Remainer. There are no people, I, I, you know, I'll take on anybody on the Remain leave argument still. But it's over, done, however satisfying it is in some ways for people. And I know some people who are seeing all of this and saying, see, told you so, disaster. I don't actually believe that much, though I would like to, because um, it plays to the narrative that's still going on in my head, I can confess. Um, but the truth is quite a lot of, a large chunk of this is nothing to do with leave remain. Um, some of it is to do, there are other leave remain problems, incidentally, for food manufacturing, which I haven't even started to talk about, which is the ridiculous situation that we're in at the moment, where it's it's almost impossible, where we've seen a massive fall in the number of food exports, uh, food exporters, um, although a relatively small number of businesses actually actively pursue export, something around 40% of UK food manufacturers that export just about everybody imports because everybody imports ingredients if nothing else um but the the disadvantage that exporters enjoy if that's the right word right verb over importers or the, the advantages importers enjoy over exporters is ridiculous so we are in this situation particularly with pigs for example so pigs uh, the carbon dioxide shortage has stopped many pig uh, producers or pig meat producers uh, slaughtering their animals and as a consequence the animals have grown too big they can't be slaughtered in the normal way they can't be used for uh, they can't be butchered and indeed you, as well as not having the right number of workers in um, 
abattoirs, many uh, many businesses don't have the right number of butchers. Uh, but those those issues um, mean that supermarkets and others can still bring in cheap pig meat from Denmark and Holland completely unfettered. There are no checks. So it's actually <clears throat> ridiculously at a point when the pig industry is on its knees, we're actually assisting its competition by having no checks at all and the balance is all wrong. Nobody meant that when they talked about taking back control. Uh, but so that that is one area which I think the government should address and, and, and is not going to actually uh, clearly in the difference between export restrictions in terms of documentation and import restrictions in terms of documentation. None of this is going to be addressed at least till the end of the year and probably well into the new year. Where the government has helped is on uh, very practical help to get the main CO2 plant at Billingham back up and running and that was announced yesterday. And I think there's been a huge effort through the COVID crisis from DEFRA and other departments to help the industry. Um, I've been involved in a lot of that work. I mean, I was more or less at one point during the COVID crisis, I was on calls with George Eustace and other ministers pretty much every day and sometimes several times a day. And I don't think anybody could have been a greater help to the industry than George Eustace and his ministerial team. Um, very, very practical, very committed, very clear sighted and pretty much willing to go out on a limb and take on. <clears throat> and they still are. So, I mean, that it's absolutely clear that DEFRA browbeat the Treasury into giving help on um, on CO2. And interestingly, it took DEFRA two days to get that turned around and pay still can't on gas prices for other industries. So I pay tribute to the to the government. You ask what is temporary and what is permanent? Good question. And this is dangerous territory for somebody to start predicting. The only good news is that since I'm leaving the FDF because I'm sort of standing down, I'm retiring from the FDF, they're not from the industry. Uh, at the end of the year, you can't chase me to tell you if I've got my mystic meg hat on and it hasn't worked. But so my, my basic guess is I do think that the gas price hike, which has caused, which is behind the CO2 crisis and behind a number of other concerns, gas at an all time high. And of course, most food factories work on gas. I actually think that that may be temporary. I think we may see gas prices come down, particularly if there can be some accommodation reached with Russia in terms of supply. So that might be temporary. The labour shortages I don't think are temporary. I think the labour shortages are permanent unless the government chooses to adopt a different immigration policy. And I don't think they will until they're absolutely convinced that they've followed the wrong course here. And that's going to take ages, if at all. So that's not temporary. Um, I think some of the other, you know, some of the individual sectors may be sortable. So I do think it's possible potentially, uh, as it happens, to sort the butcher's issue. I think that may be doable. I don't think I, I'm I think the HGV thing is much more difficult for two or three reasons. One is it's extremely, you know, I, I'm not very keen on the idea of HGV drivers being rushed through tests. I think there'll be old ladies across the country who will be worried for the safety of their cats. Um, and many of us will be worried for our own safety. <clears throat> so I don't think that's a good idea. But I do think that, that there may be some ways of encouraging people back from uh, having gone into working in other parts of the industry or other industries back into the cab. But one of the things that's going to make that happen is higher wages. And of course, that fuels inflation. And another is that we treat HGV drivers properly and some of the conditions in which they've had to operate have been disgusting. And, you know, we should we should revere the work they do. It is not in any way. You know, it's not a pleasant job. It's an extremely dangerous job. It's an un, it's a, and it's an unpleasant job. It's a solitary job by and large as well. And we need to do something to improve their conditions just as much as their pay. So some of these things are temporary. Some of them are permanent. I think there are technological solutions as with the drones. I think automation in factories is is one route and indeed in farms is one route to go. And I think when automation and AI are deployed, that will be a, a real step forward. The only thing is there's a lot of business here, there are a lot of businesses with a really difficult, as you all know, as you know from 
both you know Santander and Bishop Fleming's experience, and, and no doubt lots of people on the call, there are some serious barriers to businesses being able to find the space in their balance sheet, in their P&L, to, to, to be able to deploy capital to investment in robotics. This is expensive, long-term stuff. And we will need government to come up with some incentives, either in the form of tax credits or of grants or of other pump priming mechanisms to allow that to happen. But I think the government is listening to us on that. Thanks, Ian. Um, and just um, so hopefully, hopefully not so mystic, Meg, but obviously there's been a lot of work been happening on the national uh, food strategy uh, with the independent review from Henry Dimbleby early this year. Um, do you want to just tell us a little bit about what the FDF are doing, I guess, on that? And I guess any insight you might have for business in terms of what might come out of that? Sure. Well, uh, for those who don't follow these things closely, uh, three years ago, Michael Gove, who was then, <coughs> excuse me, DEFRA secretary, um, asked Henry Dimbleby, the uh, guy who used to run and own Leon, Leon the um, uh, upscale, upmarket uh, um, takeaway and out of home, um, I don't know what you call it, but anyway, um, find sort of casual dining um, and takeaway. They, he asked Henry to, who is the non one of the non-exec directors, independent non-execs at, at DEFRA, to produce uh, a contribution to a national food strategy. Uh, we welcome that at the FTF because it, we, we think we need a national food strategy. We haven't had a national food strategy since 1947 in this country. And then it was a consequence of the war when you know there were very good reasons, the Second World War, when there were very, very good reasons to, uh, to have a national food strategy. In fact, one of my predecessors, Sir John Bodinar, was the, uh, was the person who fed the nation during the war. And uh, he was the second secretary, at, uh, permanent secretary at DEFRA. And he was the person who dis, um, devised the idea of dig for victory, that people should plant their own food. And he was responsible for making sure the nation stayed fed. Um, and so it's right that the FDF should be very committed to a, a new national food strategy. We think that it's important because we think, you know, I, I've said this before, that, that food is a matter of national security. If you can't feed a country, you don't have a country. And we need in the post-Brexit, post-Covid world, even more, though that neither of those had happened when Henry was commissioned, we need to know how we will manage to feed the country going forward. So Henry has produced a very, a very, very comprehensive and authoritative report. I don't agree with all of the stuff that's in it. I particularly don't agree about <coughs> sugar taxes and salt taxes, but there are some other bits I don't agree with. But for the, you know, is a very, very significant and very important and worthwhile contribution to the to a debate that will now happen on what our strategy should be. Uh, I chair the Food and Drink Sector Council with two others. I'm a co-chair of that, um, which is the government's advisory body bringing together the whole industry from farm to fork. And we've just published at the end of last week a, a document that also is a contribution to the debate. And the FDF is going to publish its own uh, independent uh, set of contributions, mostly actually on skills uh, or primarily on skills in the next few days. So. We are very much engaged in this debate, um, skills and exports, I should have said, because we also have a, a very, very clear view of things we should do on exports. I think it's really important that everybody on this call begins to follow that debate as well, because the, the, the role of the strategy is to set the framework in which the, the food and drink industry operates going forward. And as I've said, there are loads of challenges. There are challenges on labour, there are challenges on food price inflation, there are questions about where we should get our imports from. The whole question of net zero begins to ask how many food miles should you be expecting your food to have taken to get to you? How do you want to support food exports that go a long way around the world and maybe uh, massively, <coughs> massively challenged in their carbon production as a consequence of you know, the travel that they have to undertake? But equally, we need a thriving food and drink sector, and that, in our view, rests on international trade. So reconciling some of those issues and deciding what we need to do here, how we're going to support our exporters, how we're going to mitigate the problems that our importers will face, 
how we're going to deal with labour, what kind of food we produce, because there's a whole diet and health aspect to this. Very, very contentious stuff. Some of it on sugar and how we, uh, how we deal with obesity. Some of it on whether we should or should not eat meat. Some of it whether we should eat, you know, what kind of other products should we eat? What should we be doing about planting food? We haven't talked at all about farming. It's beyond my brief. But there's no doubt that the way in which farming and, and food manufacture interact is going to change markedly over the next 10, 15 years as we approach 2040 and we get on to net zero by 2040, which is the commitment pretty much the whole industry has made, often without entirely knowing how it's going to meet those commitments, I should say. Um, so, yeah, this is kind of a, a big scale uh, question, and it's one that, that the national food strategy in all its different manifestations is designed or will be designed to answer. We think that the government is going to come back with its first shot at the strategy either just before or just after Christmas. Um, maybe a white paper, maybe a government, uh, a government statement, maybe quite comprehensive. I think it's unlikely to involve a lot of new, new legislation because things like net zero, the um, obesity regulations in terms of promotions and advertising, the stuff on plastics and packaging is all in other legislation already in flight and their government doesn't appear to have a lot of time as in parliamentary time available for anything much more. Uh, so I think it will be much more frameworks and, and assertion and we will be asked to fit in with those. But that's not a bad thing. That may mean that there's more scope for creativity. Um, but certainly I think we're going to see a fairly comprehensive statement from the government in the next um, three months, probably. Thanks, Ian. Thanks very much, Ian. You know, there's, there's so much to unpick there, but I just love the fact how we've managed to pivot from the challenges more to the change in the solutions and it's especially how kind of the ESG agenda, responsible business, you know, the food and drink industry is a huge agent for change there. Um, so I guess keeping on the positive mindset, um, a question from the audience has come in. We did touch on this, but specifically, where do you see the greatest opportunities for food exporters in the UK or potential food exporters from the UK? Well, I think the, the place which is lagging behind is England. <clears throat> so you look at the work that the Scottish government, the Welsh government and the Northern Irish uh, government have done on their own exports and the work that the, the, the amazing work of bought beer in Ireland, in the Republic of Ireland. And you can say those those uh, those evolved nations and the Republic have have really set their cap at, at boosting food exports. There are lots of initiatives in England, but they're not properly coordinated. So where I live in the East Midlands, you have Melton Rural Capital of Food for England and a fantastic amount of work done on um, Melton Mowbray pork pies, Stilton cheese, both of which come from more or less where I live and a whole range of other issues and other products as well. But those issues, they, that, that work is not coordinated with what goes on in Suffolk or what goes on in Westmoreland or what goes on in the Southwest. Some very, really exciting initiatives down in the Southwest from, from um, different producers. Not coordinated with what organic food does. It's not coordinated with what British beer does. It's on and on and on. And we do need, and we very nearly got to when David Rutley was the uh, food supply minister in the about three years ago, we very nearly got to an agreement about how this would work and we haven't done that. So there's a big opportunity there. And if the English can catch up, then I think there is a, in terms of the framework and the support that comes from government, I think we'll see food export councillors being put in place at many of our primary um, embassies overseas. I think we may yet see a new UK food promotion body come into existence. I certainly hope so. I certainly think we're going to get a UK Food Export Council. Um, and those will all be important moves. In terms of uh, markets, I do think some of the trade deals that are being done are quite exciting, potentially. I'm a huge believer that the two biggest potential markets are Japan and India. 
uh, Japan, because it's got a very sophisticated distribution system, not unlike our own, um, and India, because there are just lots of people. Um, and, you know, the, although many of them are, are strikingly challenged economically, there are also enormous numbers, just because there are 1.4 billion or whatever it is, people living in India, there are massive numbers of people in that Indian middle class who crave back brands and actually have an affinity with British brands because of the, um, because of the history of the two countries together. So I think there are big opportunities. I think the, the, the difficulty is if you're an exporter in a relatively small business, it's quite difficult to know where you go. It's quite difficult to get out there with your Davy Crockett hat on and go out prospecting into the wild blue yonder and hope to come back with too many, uh, with too many orders. And I think that's why you need advice and you need support from British embassies overseas. And that's why I think it's really urgent that they put that in place. But we have lots and lots of great examples of people being very successful doing this stuff. So I think there's a real, I do think for food exporters, the big opportunities come in India and Japan. And I would also say that if we do join the trans, the CPTPP, the cooperation agreement between Pacific nations, and it does look as though that's a pretty big um, priority for us. The CPTPP, which includes Japan and Australia and so on, does provide a really interesting opportunity, but it also gives us a great opportunity, which I don't think many people have thought through. We have been the regulatory uh, uh, kind of lead player in many ways in the European Union. And there is a concern that, that European regulation will become more cautious with the absence of the uh, FSA in the councils of Europe. That's probably true, but there's a big chance for the UK to lead on uh, regulation in the CPTPP. And if we could get to be the regulatory hub for India and uh, Japan, then I think that would be a prize worth pursuing as well. Thanks, Ian. Conscious of time, I'm conscious that uh, probably won't get to all the questions today. Um, but I was just thinking um, about kind of last words of advice from you, Ian. You obviously talked about the challenges, and, and there are, um, but there is a huge amount of opportunity for food and drink businesses. Um, do you have any wise words for our audience? Haven't they all been wise so far? What do you mean? Um, I, uh, well, really not. Um, First of all, my, my wisest word is take absolutely no notice of what I've said, um, because, you know, as a Crystal Palace supporter and a lifelong Liberal Democrat, my whole life has been a triumph of hope over expectation. So you have to you have to just keep that in mind. Um, what I would say is this. It is a privilege to be in this industry. Because. Food is something that everybody in the UK, particularly, but worldwide, uh, with which it's a, a product with which everybody has a special relationship. You know, it, it is a truism that we all have to eat and drink, but we do. So you are you are immediately have an opportunity that, for example, those in automotive or in the auto um, the automotive industry those in the aerospace industry and to a degree those in the chemical industry, perhaps less so the pharmaceutical industry, but for different reasons. We have an opportunity they don't have because people are gonna come and buy our products at some level. Secondly, it's evident from everything you see on telly, reading the press, listen to on the radio, everybody or very, very large numbers of people love talking about food and drink. We have a, a really completely unique relationship with it. Again, that's a privilege not to be uh, kind of taken for granted, but it is a privilege. And I think that that's the first thing. It's a fantastic industry and it is a great privilege to be part of it. The second thing I would say is that for all the challenges that I laid out at the start, and what I'm really trying to say when I talk about this at such length and sound so um, like some kind of dreadful Roman soothsayer, woe, woe, and thrice woe. Um, I'm trying to make the point that our industry is changing. It's, you know, we have taken for granted that availability of food. We have taken for granted those European workers. 
We have taken for granted the whole set of advantages that brings. And it is changing and it is unlikely to go back. So certainly so far as this government is in place, and I suspect any government. But with change always comes opportunity. There's fantastic opportunity uh, if you can see where it is and if you can access it. And that requires laser-like focus on a business proposition. And um, I guess my final word would be this is still the best industry. I mean, you're never going to get massively rich with a food and drink business, but you're always going to have demand. And you're always going to have a product which people can immediately, to which they can immediately relate. You don't have to explain why it's important to eat to a lot of people. And as a cut or drink. And as a consequence of that, the accessibility of your idea is really, really salient. And I think that is the other thing I would say. It's a great industry to be in. It's fantastically easy to understand. And it has salience for people who are shopping. Who are your potential customers so from my point of view i think that is a reason a strong reason to be optimistic and and you know we have a culture in this country that normally succeeds even with challenges and the best way you can illustrate that is the fact that throughout the covid crisis our guys and girls kept working even in circumstances of really considerable scariness and danger they didn't know that it was safe to go to work but they kept going uh, they kept producing and we have seen amazing changes in a crisis. And I think that's a huge testament to the to the durability and vitality of the industry. So I'm pretty optimistic about it all. Ian, that was wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, I do apologise for those that we didn't get to your questions, but um, perhaps after the webinar, if you'd like to contact any of us, then uh, then we'll come back to you on your specific questions. Fleur, uh, if you he, want me to answer those questions, if, if you send them to me, we'll try and provide some answers so that they can go back to the individuals who asked them. Ian, that would be amazing. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, just from us, just want to say a huge thank you uh, to Ian uh, for your time today and for coming back from your walking holiday in one piece and being here. Uh, you big don't thank know you I'm in one piece. There are <laughs> several pieces under the, under the desk, I can tell you, that don't work properly. My feet particularly will never recover. <laughs> that's, why, that's why we can only see you from the top up. That's exactly right. <laughs> Uh, Santander, thank you very much for uh, co-hosting with us today. I uh, really appreciate it and all the hard work of your team. And, and Jenny, uh, great to meet you doing this too. Um, we will do a, thanks, Jenny. Um, we will do a summary um, just for those that um, perhaps just want to uh, capture everything uh, from, uh, from this presentation today. Uh, and we'll have it up on our website. Um, uh, we've got a knowledge hub at Bishop Fleming, uh, but actually the easiest way to see what's, uh, what we're putting out there on social media with food and drink is to look at all of our LinkedIn's, uh, very active on LinkedIn. So uh, expect a summary soon uh, of Ian's wise words today. So thank you everyone for attending. Uh, enjoy the rest of your afternoon and uh, please join other of our webinars in the future. Thank you.